um, last week really just laid the foundation for me in terms of how everything fits together. Which I think many times is a challenge because even as you're building your life, if the foundation is not sure and solid, it can be shaken. Are you with me? And so many times there's certain things that we, when we live, you must remember everything in the world is designed to make you live as small as possible. It's designed to bind you. It's designed to keep you in bondage. There is nothing that comes from the kingdom of this world that is ever going to set you free or ever going to do anything good for you. It's not possible. Because the heart of the one that designs the system, when you look at the heart of the one that designs the system, you'll see the purpose of the system. Are you with me? God did everything out of love. His whole system and the purpose of His system was birthed from a place of love because God is love. The Bible says the thief comes to what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. So everything about His system is going to steal from you. It's going to kill you off and it's going to destroy your future and your family. There is no gray area and no middle area. Are you with me? And so the enemy's plan and plot and ploy is to what? Is to keep you in a position of having a religious experience. And the Bible says it's a form of godliness but with no power. So even though you love Jesus, even though you're saved, and even though you want to do what, what God has called you to do, because of the position that you're stuck in in terms of religion, you never ever fulfill what God has got for your life. Are you with me? And that breaks from our lives in Jesus' name. So the purpose of what we did, I'm going I'm to do a quick recap for those of you who were not here last week. Please go and watch it. But I'm going to do a quick recap for you for this morning. So we can then go into the next phase of how do you actually build your life from this stage on. Are you with me? If God is saying it's a season of elevation, a season He's going to establish you, He's going to elevate you. Are you with me? God's going to put you in the position and the places and the spaces that He's ordained for you. Then how do we transition into that place? Are you with me? Amen. So today's sermon title is called Limitless. Look at your neighbor and say Limitless. I don't know if you watched that movie Limitless. Anybody watch the movie Limitless? Don't judge me. But it's a movie where this guy takes a tablet and this tablet gives him the ability to use 100% capacity and capability of his brain. And he begins to live in a realm that is limitless. He can see things coming before they come. He can calculate things before you could even think of it. And he can actually map out certain steps without anything having played out. And it gives him an advantage. Are you with me? He walks around with an advantage. Are you with me? When you understand what God has ordained for you, how he set this whole, all of creation up, how he's called you and established you and who he's made you to be, you will understand that you actually are limitless. You have an advantage that nobody else has. No other person, no other individual, unless you are saved and born again, born anew, you do not have the advantage that we have. But why do we live lower than the people that don't have what we have? It's things that we must question as a people. Because you see, if God is saying it's a season of establishment and elevation, if your elevation is below God's elevation for you, God can only do what you can see Him do. Are you with me? I'm getting ahead of myself. Go back to that picture we deal with in the beginning. The spiritual realm, blah, blah, blah. The first image I gave you, have you got it there? I just want to do a quick recap. So as you can see, there, there's the spiritual realm. You have heaven is established in the spiritual realm. God's throne, there's a place in heaven that is a sign for God and His throne. And it's the place where He dwells. Amen. Then you have the spiritual realm and then you have earth, which is the natural realm in the universe and so forth. But when God said in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. God who was standing, leave the picture, don't go to the scripture. As you were standing outside of Every natural form of creation, God who is spirit. The Bible says God is spirit, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God who is spirit, who's positioned in the realm of the spirit. Before there was a natural world, there was nothing natural. That means the only reality was what? 
the spiritual realm. So the spiritual realm is first. It's the source realm. It's the superior realm. When God said in the beginning, God said, let us make the heavens and the earth. He formed everything, everything that has formed, the table, all these things, everything that has formed came out of the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm is the mother realm. It's the superior realm. It's the controlling realm. Are you with me? Whatever happens in the spiritual realm, dictate what's happened in this realm because it is superior. Are you understanding me? So when God made everything, when He put everything together, the first place, the place where He started, which was the source place, was the spiritual realm. And the reason why I'm saying this to you is because sometimes we treat the spiritual realm as some mystical place, as some secondary option for life. Are you with me? And when you do that, you submit yourself to the natural realm. And when you submit yourself to the natural realm, whoever's controlling the atmosphere of that natural realm that you're submitting yourself to, you're submitting yourself to it. Are you understanding me? So if you're submitting yourself to something that is controlled by the enemy, because everything in the natural is controlled by something in the spiritual. So if you're submitting yourself to an atmosphere that's controlled by the enemy, guess what? The enemy is controlling you. There is no middle ground. Please hear me. There is no space that you can go and sit and watch certain things play out and then make a decision. No. If you're not submitted to the kingdom of God, I'm sorry to tell you, but you submitted to the enemy, his plan and his work over your life. Hebrews 11 verse 3 says, by faith, keep that picture up. It says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by what? By the word of God, so that the things which are seen are not made of the things which are visible. So just because something's not seen doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Do you have a brain? Well, I hope so. (laughs) Do you have a brain? Let's try this again. Yes, thank you, Jesus. I know you might think some people don't, but don't be rude. Did you see your brain? So how do you know it exists? Through knowledge. Somebody told you so. Are you with me? So just because you can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Are you with me? Just because you can't see the things that are making the things that you see does not mean that the things that you don't see don't exist. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18 says, While we do not look at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen, where we now? But the things that are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. He's saying that the realm that you don't see in the spiritual realm The realm that you cannot see with your natural eye, that is the eternal realm. That means whatever is established in that realm will forever be. Because anything established for eternity does not change. When you come down to the earth realm, when you come down to the natural realm, it says those things are what? Are temporary. Anything that's temporary is subject to change. It doesn't last forever. When you go and get your license and they give you a temporary license, it's only for six months. And it's done. What happens? It changes afterwards. Any situation or circumstance that you're facing in your life right now that is not based upon the kingdom of God, the principle of God, the word of God, and not based upon the truth of God's word in the spiritual realm is subject to change. But when you are living below what God has called you to live, you will limit your life and not experience the limitless that God has got for you. Amen. I'm just laying a foundation. I want to get us on the same page. But the key thing to note is that the spirit realm is first. It's the superior realm. It's the causal realm. Whatever you are seeing or experiencing in this earth right now is because of something spiritual that's taken place either through the governance of the kingdom of God or the governance of the kingdom of darkness. No middle ground. Are you with me? Every war that's playing out, it's not just by the by or something that just happened. That is not a natural occurrence. Somebody had to agree with the kingdom of darkness or the plan and plot and scheme of the enemy in order for that thing to be made manifest in the earth because it cannot find manifestation in the natural outside of a spiritual root or source. 
everything, 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 everything is subject and submitted somehow, some way to the spiritual realm. And if you understand that, it means that you're going to know where to go when you need to change things. If you don't like what you see in your life, in the natural, if you're looking at the natural and you're saying, but this thing that is seen does not line up with what God says, then you must go to the things that you don't see and change it in the unseen so that the seen can change. Are you with me this morning? Next level, God creates man. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, you can go to the scripture. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle and over everything that creeps upon the earth. So God says, I make these two realms, right? I'm in heaven. I'm in the spiritual realm. This is my place. And I make the earth. And God, before he makes the man, still has power over the earth. In terms of he has direct access. Are you with me? Then he makes the man. When he makes this man in Genesis 1 verse 26, it's a spirit man. There was no natural man yet. Are you with me? Because only in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 does the Bible say he makes the form of an earth suit or a body for a man to live in. And then it says he breathes the very breath of life. The man that he made in Genesis 1 verse 26, the spirit man, he breathes that man into this vessel. Why? Because you cannot live or exist in this realm without a body. Are you with me? If you lose the body, you're no longer here. That's why death in the natural state is not so much the non-existence or life or the ceasing of life. It's the transitioning of life. Because the spirit man that could exist here can no longer exist here because he does not have a body. Are you understanding me this morning? So when God makes the man, he makes the man who? Spirit first. So you are, when you call Brian, when you call Jester, Elder Jester, when you call Brian, it's an inside joke, don't worry. When you call Jester, what is it? I'm speaking, I see his body. Are you with me? But I'm actually speaking to the Jester that's inside that body. Because he, the body, is not Jester. It's only the body. The jester, the true jester is the spirit. Are you understanding me this morning? So when God makes you, he makes you what? Spirit. He makes you in the realm that is dominant. He makes you of the substance that is superior. He makes you in the unseen place. He makes you, that's why, listen to me. It says the things that are unseen are what? Eternal. Your spirit man is eternal. That's why there's hell and heaven. Because when you die here a natural death, that spirit needs to go somewhere. Because it cannot end. It never ceases. That spirit, your spirit lives forever. But if you don't choose God, you're going to have to be in a place in the spiritual realm that is completely separated from Him, which is hell. Are you understanding me? And for eternity, that spirit will have to remain in hell because that spirit never chose Him while on earth. Are you with me? But for those who chose Him, you will forever be with Him. Because your spirit is eternally connected to Him the day you say yes to Him. Are you with me? So when God makes the spirit man, He makes a superior man. He makes a being that is far superior than anything in the natural. You can look at Adam and look at the life of Jesus. Jesus could walk on water. Why? He had dominion over everything that was natural. When he said, I made him in my image, image is what? Exact duplicate of kind. When he said, likeness is with the ability to function like I can function. Make a being that carries the potential like me and actually looks like me. And when he functions in the earth, he's going to have dominion. He's going to have kingdom. He's going to have rulership over. Why? Because he comes from a superior place. That's why Genesis, uh, Psalm chapter 8 in the, in the message version, just go there for me. Psalms chapter 8 in the message from verse 3. This is what we the crux or the, the basis of what, what we were dealing with last, year, last week. Come. I look up at your macro skies, dark and enormous, your handmade sky jewelry, moon and stars mounted in their settings. 
Then I look at my micro self and wonder, why do you bother with us? Why take a second look our way? Yet we've so narrowly missed being what? Because the Bible says he made you a little lower than Elohim. He made you a little lower than himself. Bright with Eden's dawn light, keep going. You put us in charge of your handcrafted world. Repeated to us your Genesis charge. Made us lords of sheep and cattle, even animals out in the wild. Birds flying, fish swimming. Today. Go back to uh, Psalm chapter 8 verse, verse 6, I think, in the, in the New King James. Go back one. It says, for you made him. Go back another one. What is man that you are? Mindful of him. Let's find a man that you visit him. Keep going. For you have made him a little lower than that word. They didn't translate it correctly. It's actually Elohim, which is God. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. Keep going. You have made him to have dominion over the works of the hands. He says, you made this being. They're looking and saying, but who is this being that you made? To be just a little lower than you. Just a little lower than you. Who's this being that you made? And then you still give him dominion over the works of the hands. What is he saying? He's saying, God gives man the authority to determine which aspect of the spiritual realm is going to govern in the earth. Either if you are a man, if you are a being, man, submitted to the kingdom of God or you submitted to the kingdom of this world. Are you with me? If you submitted to the kingdom of God, that means the kingdom of God has now access through you into the earth to influence the earth because God can't move in the earth outside of a man. He did it himself. When he said those words in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, he locked himself out. That's why when he had to fix everything, he had to send his son Jesus. Jesus had to come as a had to come as a, he had to come as a man. Why? He would have violated his own word and he just come in and fixed it as God. He needs to have a man. If you look throughout the Bible, from Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, uh, Noah, David, all of them had to do what? They had to agree with God. They had to give God access as powerful as the creator of the universe of the heavens e and the earth is he needs a man and when i say man it's not gender based it's man i'm talking about creation to agree with him to have access i'm explaining this to you because i want you to understand that there's nothing that's happening in this earth that somebody did not say yes to there isn't there cannot be, if there is, it's a direct violation of the principle of the spirit and the, and the natural. And the Bible says, if one of his words falls to the ground, everything will end. Are you with me? So, a man, the creation, and if you read Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, it says, in that man was male and female. So I'm not referring to gender, I'm referring to species. He says, in that man, when that man says, yes, it can take place in the earth. If this man says, no, it will not take place in the earth. If you go to Genesis chapter 3, it says, when Satan tempted Eve, he did not come. Satan didn't come guns blazing. You know what I mean? Skopsky, ten donor movie, kick open the door, shoot, the, shoot men, you know, shoot Adam, shoot Eve, I'll take over. He couldn't take over. He did not have right to. He would have violated the principle and judgment would have been his portion. He did not have the right to access it. So what did he have to do? He had to get them to agree with him and not God. You see, the reason why there was the, the, the fruit in the, there's not the apple, eh? There's no scriptural reference that there was an apple, that the, Eve ate the apple, just so we know. There's no scriptural reference to any type of fruit. It was just the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. It says when she ate of it, their eyes were opened. They dropped out of a level of where they were initially positioned from a spiritual plane into a natural plane and now were no longer connected to God's plan and purpose. Why? God put it there and says, as long as you choose it, you choose me. You with me? If you choose to obey me, you choose to obey the law that I gave you, it means that you continue in agreement with me and the kingdom of God, which is my system of governance, will continue to reign in the earth. But the day you eat of it is the day you say no to me and the day you say yes to the devil. That's why Jesus tells him, says, he says, you are of your father who? The devil. And they were the Pharisees. They were the highest of the religious people in the, Jewish, in the Jewish culture and custom and religion. He says, you have your father, the devil. Why? Because they were not born again. Are you with me? 
They were submitted to the enemy and his system. Religion, hear me. Religion is a design of Satan. It's a design of Satan. It's not designed to liberate you. It's not designed to bring you into the freedom of what God has paid for and what God has ordained for life. Religion will keep you bound for the rest of your days and you will think you're doing something good, but you'll have no power to change nothing in your life because they'll never teach you how to live out of this place. Amen. So Jesus comes and Jesus comes and after man sins, the spirit man, this portion of him dies. And when he dies, it doesn't mean it ceases, what well, it doesn't cease to exist. It's a separation from source. Are you with me? If you take a fish out of the water, what's going to happen? Death is inevitable. Why? Because you removed it from its. When Adam was made, Adam was made to live forever. When they took the spirit man out of God, who is the source, the eventuality was what? Was death in the natural. And complete and utter separation for eternity from God. God then makes a plan and makes a way through Jesus Christ who comes, dies on the cross, saves our sins. Are you with me? Saves us our sins. He, 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 he pays the penalty that we could not pay for what was required for the sin that was created. And through Him now, when we get born again, born anew, are you with me? This part of our being gets born again. This part becomes new. This remains. Are you with me? This remains. This becomes brand new. The Bible says you become a new creature. Means that you didn't look like what you could ever have looked at before. Something that possessed and housed sin and death in this part of your being, forever separated from God, is now directly connected to God, living in the source who is God, and made in the image and the likeness of God. So when you are born again, when you make the decision for your salvation, the greatest miracle that could ever take place took place. We sometimes deem a breakthrough on money, a breakthrough on healing, a breakthrough on that as bigger than salvation. Salvation is the ultimate miracle because it lasts for eternity. You forever changed. That's why God says, says I'm going to cut a new covenant. And this new covenant, what? I'm going to remember your sin no more. Why? Not because God just chose to forget. Because he, one, he wiped it out of you. He had to purposefully wipe it out because he is God. But secondly, when he looks at you, he only sees the new. God sees the new you because you are not this. You possess this and this is a part of who you are. He understands it. He sees it. He knows this is perishing. Are you with me? But this is forever his. You look like Jesus looked. There's a scripture, I think it's in 1 John or 3 John. But he says that as he is, Speaking of Jesus, so are you in this world. That means when he looks at you, he sees you wrapped up in Christ. And therefore he cannot see sin in you. Because in here there's no sin. You might be hounded in here, but in here there's no sin. When he looks at you in here, he sees the perfect man. Think about it. You, that's what the Bible says, you can have no more guilt and shame before him. Why? Because this is perfect. We measure ourselves here. Why? We live below what we're supposed to live. Are you with me? We don't think of ourselves here. We think of ourselves here. Our mistakes, our failures, our thoughts, our minds, and all this rubbish that happens in this place. But we don't look here where God sees us the way that He sees us. That means wherever I go, no matter what I do, and I'm not saying you're going to be purposefully now trying to sin, because then it does mean that you don't understand this, and we're going to get into it a little bit later. But when I understand this portion of my life, I'm forever a child of God. I'm forever His favorite. Forever. Nothing can change it. No, my son cannot change who he is to me because of some action that he does. He is born of me. Irrespective if he chooses my way or doesn't choose my way, he knows he must choose my way because, yeah. But, <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so, Parenting Lesson 101, we'll have sessions uh, on another day. But, he, it doesn't change. Whatever he determines to do, whether he does something wrong, whether he does something right, he's still my son. His DNA doesn't change because of the actions. 
His makeup doesn't change because of his actions. Are you with me? He is still my boy. So no matter what you're struggling with, faced with, fighting with, you see, what the enemy wants you to do is to disconnect from God. And when you disconnect from God, you don't have the power to overcome the thing that's, that's pressuring you. Another friend, I shared this yesterday, a friend of mine committed suicide yesterday. Two boys he leaves behind. Smart individual. I mean, I knew him, I know him now 20 years. When I met him, I was like, yo, this guy's on a whole nother level. From where I come from and from where he comes from, I'm like, wow. Grew up with everything. Not in a way that his parents gave him everything, but he had the opportunities that he, that he took, took him and elevated him in his career and in his life like on levels. But when he could not deal with the stuff that was hounding him here, The only way for him was out was, I need to end it. But it's because he didn't know about this. Are you hearing me? The enemy will come here and hound you. He will continuously try to keep you from this place of knowing who you are in Christ and who God is to you. And he'll continue to put you under pressure to make you subject your life to the limitations of this world. And never to step into the experience of the limitless living and the limitless power, the limitless breakthrough that God has got for you in the spirit. That's why this word needs to go out, people. As many, I mean, he's my age and he, he, did, and he made that decision. I still, I, I still can't fathom it. I'm still struggling to believe that he's actually gone. But you know what? There's so many young people that are doing the same. Their whole lives ahead of them and are making those decisions. The word must get out, people. Hear me. Whatever God has called you to do, His word must get out. There's a part that you have to play in this vision to get what? To get the word out. Why? Because there's hope for a generation. There's a way out for people. If we understand what God has really done, then we will fully, fully be appreciative of the life that we can actually live and how much more you would want it for others. Please hear me. This is the only way. With the way the world is going, there's no other way because the world cannot give you what you require. It's an impossibility. It's not even improbable. It's impossible for the world to give you what you need in order to be successful, to, be, to live a life of significance, to live a life that's healing, to live a life that's old. This world cannot give it to you because its designer and maker is designed to take you out. Jesus comes and he stores everything, puts everything back in its place, and now man is made in the image and the likeness of God. In 1 Peter 1 verse 23, it says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and bides forever. Romans 8 verse 15 to 17, it says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, What? Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are what? We are children of God. And if children, then heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified for, together. What is He saying? You are children of God. The Holy Spirit bears with your spirit and says that that's your Abba. Abba, in our way of saying it, would be Daddy. That's my Daddy. When I'm in my private time and I'm praying with the Lord, I call Him Daddy. Why? It's to reinforce inside of me the close proximity of that relationship that is created. I understand, okay, God and so forth, but he's my daddy, man. He's my daddy. He's got mercy over me. That even when I make a mistake, I don't know what that boy did. I don't know how far and deep down in the rabbit hole he was. But no matter what he did and no matter how far down he was, there was a way of escape. There was a way of escape. God would have rescued him wherever. God will rescue you wherever, no matter what you're sitting in, no matter. God will rescue you. If you cry out to God, hear me, He will rescue you. There is no father that would leave their son in a mess to die.
So that's basically where we ended off last week, right? We understood <laughs> spirit, natural, man. Man is, in terms of the natural, the center of everything. Not because we wanted it. He designed it that way. Are you with me? He designed it that way. So you I find some people, they always say like, you know, I don't know what humans think they are, that they must be the center of everything. No, I didn't choose it. If you believe you came from a monkey, sharp, 100%. I don't. I came from God. <laughs> and when I got saved, I'm made in the image and the likeness of who he is. And he delegated. He determined to give me the authority over this planet. He said over the universe and over the earth and over all my natural creation. He says he gave him dominion. So if anything's happening in this place that does not line up with what we needed to be in terms of what God has wanted it to be, then that means that we're doing something wrong. Are you with me? And just a quick side note. The kingdom of darkness is nowhere near the same power as the kingdom of light. Please hear me. It's nowhere near. The power is not the same. The power is not the same. This kingdom is a superior kingdom. Are you understanding me? That's why and I love the fact that they use light and darkness. Because you only remain in darkness if you refuse to put on the light. But if you put on that light, there's no fight. There's no fight. Go in the dark room and put on the light and go here if darkness shouts back. Go and check if there's a struggle. There. Half the room lights up, you know what I'm saying? And darkness is pushing back and light is pushing and saying, no, I'm lighting the room. No, I'm keeping my, no, I'm lighting, no, I'm keeping my, no. You put the light on immediately, it's gone. Immediately. The minute you choose to step into who Christ made it to be, immediately everything else is inferior. Immediately. The only reason why you're in darkness is because you choose to sit in darkness. Jesus will heal your toes. So, let's deal with this now. Who is the real you then? If we're dealing with the spirit man, because the way I want to go this morning. If we're dealing with the spirit man, I've got 20 minutes. If we're dealing with the spirit man, what does this mean? When you, was, when you got saved, when you're born again in the incorruptible seed of the word of God, the Bible says, now number one, Colossians chapter two, verse nine. I want to go through this very quickly. You have to work with me. For in him who is Christ, right, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Next. And you, who is us, are complete in who? In him, who is the head of all principality and power. Go back one. For in Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And if I'm in Christ and Christ is in me, then where's the fullness of the Godhead? The fullness of the Godhead inside of me. God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is living on the inside of me. They have expression in and through where? My spirit. Think about it. The creator of everything lives inside of you. The one who made everything, the one who brought everything into existence lives on the inside of you. Number two, you are blessed. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That means you are walking in the fullness of the blessing. The blessing is the empowerment to prosper. It's the anointing of God through which divine favor flows. And it's the power of God that overrides the curse. That means wherever you go, when you have the blessing upon you, you walk in a divine empowerment that wherever you go, the curse must fail. Whether it's sickness, poverty, disease, whatever it is, the curse must fail. This is what is locked up in this man. I am. Say, I am blessed. Say, I am blessed. There's a book I read called The Blessing of, the blessing of Abraham, The Blessing of God, or, the, or The Blessing. But it speaks about God. When it speaks about the blessing, it speaks about the same power that God used to create everything. That's how much power God has put in your hands. You are the righteousness of God and you are forever given. Hebrews 8 verse 12. He says, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. There's many scriptures that you can go and look at even in the book of Romans especially. There's a lot in there that deals with the righteousness. Righteousness means that you are in right standing with God. Are you with me? So if you had to come before the throne and the courts of heaven and stand before the courts and you are still a sinner, you've got all these records against you. Are you with me? So if you had to go to court and you broke and you, um, you stole something from somebody, you, can, you violated the law. And now when you come before the judge, the judge will say, no, you are unrighteous. Why? Because you broke the law. 
And then you have to do what? You have to pay a penalty. There's a sentence. There's a judgment that comes your way. Why? Because you're unrighteous. Only once you fulfill the penalty or fulfill the sentence and you come out of prison, then you are again righteous. Why? Because you paid for the fact that you broke the law. The same with Jesus. When Adam made that decision right in the beginning, sin entered the world. When Jesus did what he did, he killed off the power of sin over mankind forever. That the day that you choose him and you come and stand in the accuser, the Bible calls him the accuser, the better than Satan. And he says, no, but Brian did this, he did this, he did this, he did this, he did this. He says, no, but Jesus paid the penalty for that, for that, for that, for that, for that. And because he chose me, all of this is now wiped clean. The sentence is paid. He's done his time. He's free. He's in right standing with me. And the Bible says it's forever. If I mess up tomorrow, I don't have to go back and say, you know what, I, I'm now unrighteous, I need to be made righteous again. No. I go, I repent of my sin, I say, God, you've got to empower me to do better. You know what I mean? I'm going to change this thing in my life. But it does not change the fact that I am the righteousness of God. That's why you can come no matter where you are, no matter what decision you've made, no matter how deep you are in something that you've done wrong, you can come before the throne room of grace to obtain mercy for your faults and grace to help in your time of need. You can come before Him without guilt, condemnation, or shame. The Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are, where, who are in Christ Jesus. When I stand before Him, no matter if I sinned yesterday, today, or tomorrow, Jesus paid the price for every. Everything. When I stand before him, I can say, Daddy, I messed up. He says, it's okay. I don't remember your son anymore. You stole my son. I'm going to empower you in the next season to overcome. Are you with me? I am forever forgiven. Your son of your past, your son of today, and your son of forever is forever dealt with on the cross of Jesus Christ. Next one, you have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, For who has known or understood the mind and the counsels and the purposes of the Lord, so as to guide and instruct Him and give Him knowledge. But we have what? We have what? We have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. You hold the thoughts, the feelings, and the purposes of His heart. You have access to that mind. Are you with me? The thoughts that you think, if you think you're not smart enough, hear me. I was never smart enough. But with the mind of Christ, I can think things that are way above any other person in my environment. You have the kingdom of God in you. First Corinthians, not that one. Luke chapter 17 verse 21. It says, no other say see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is where? It's within you. You are loaded. You are loaded. Like loaded on a whole nother level. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You are always victorious. Always victorious. There's nothing that you will never win. There's no battle that you could ever face that you'll come out to lose. It's not possible. Why? In your spirit, victory is assigned. It's already done. And the last one, you possess every promise. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 in the Amplified. Let's all go there together. It says, for as many as are the promises of God, all the promises that you found in the Word of God, they all find their what? Their yes in Him who is who? Christ. For this is also utter what? Amen. So be it to God through Him in His person and by His agency to the glory of God. He says what? All promises are yes and amen in where? In Christ. You are in Christ. That means every promise is already fulfilled in your life. This is your reality. Please hear me. The reason why I'm saying this to you is because if you understand that the spiritual realm is first, it's the source realm, it's the primary realm, and you understand that the natural is subject to that realm, and you can understand then that the real is not this, because this is temporary. These things can change, but they don't change. There it's real, it's done. It's done. Everything is done. Your victory is where? It's done in that realm. It's real already. You're not when you, listen, listen to me. The Bible says every promise is fulfilled. That means every form of healing from every form of sickness, disease, of anything. Anything that touches your body that's ungodly. The Bible says you heal. Oh, you are healed. Here's the thing. In this place, it mustn't happen. It's already happened. It's already a reality. I think it's Revelation chapter 13. 
Where's the scripture? Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, it says, And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life and the Lamb of the Lamb, what? Who was slain from where? How? How was sin paid for already before the foundation of the earth was formed? In this place, it was already a reality in the spiritual realm. Time has to catch up with what God has already done. That's why when you get a prophetic word, a prophetic word is not what God's going to do. It's what God has already done. If you got that word that you're going to be preaching all across the world, or you got that word that you're going to be whatever it is, when God says it, He's standing in a place of already done. He's reading to you the reality of who you are, and only through a matter of time will it be made manifest in this realm. But in this realm, it's already you. It's like reading, you know when you read the packet of a seed? You see the picture of what's it going to be, Right? But it's still a seed. But is it the picture? Yes. The potential and the reality of that seed is what? Is the picture. If you plant the seed, you're going to get the picture. So when God says to you, this is who you are. All you have to do is lay your life down. And it's only a matter of time before you're going to process and become what God has ordained and called you to be. But it's not something that's not a reality. It is the reality of heaven. Please hear me, your healing, it's real. Your salvation, done. Your, your wealth, done. Everything that you could ever need, soundness of mind. That's why, listen to me, there is no depression in the kingdom. I understand people have a fight. Please don't, don't, don't take this the wrong way. Don't take this the wrong way. Because even though you might go through seasons where you lack, it does not make you poor. Because the reality is I'm wealthy. Even though I go through seasons where there's symptoms of sickness trying to attach itself to my body, it's not the reality. The reality is I'm healed. Are you understanding me? So even when they diagnosed the apostle and said, look here, you must give up this, do this, whatever. You've got a minimum of nine months before you can ever see anything. He said, no, that's what you say here. But my reality is what? Is that I'm healed. I'm not trying to get healed because I am spirit. I'm not body. I'm spirit. And this now, I'm standing here in order for this to influence this. Just put up that picture quickly for me. The picture where you see it at uh, spirit, soul, and body, and where you have revelation coming this side and you have manifestation on the other side. If you have it, you can have it. If you don't, you don't. It's fine. What I'm trying to, to, to let you know this morning is that this is where you call to live out of. There you have it there. When the kingdom of God influences you here and you live out of this place, it will affect your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And eventually it will be made manifest here. So when you trust in God for your healing, you go to the truth of who you are. What is the real? By stripes I am made whole. That's the real. That's the reality of who I am. I cannot be sick. Sickness cannot be a part of my life. Why? Because I am the healed. So I'm here. I need to meditate on His Word here to make sure this lines up with this. And the minute these two are in agreement, there's a manifestation. Jesus says, I've come to give you life. Life in abundance till the full until it overflows. The life is here. It must overflow into here. Are you with me? The challenge is many of you are looking here and not looking here. You're trying to fix something here. And it's not possible. It can only be fixed here. Are you with me? Anything in your life that does not line up with the Word of God, you must go here to fix it. The key then is, I must learn how to possess what I already own here. Yeah. Because that's the gap, right? Are you with me? The gap is that I have this full life that is here, but I'm not seeing the fullness of this life over here. Amen? That's the gap. The gap is how do I get it from here 
to experience it. And when I say body, I'm speaking about the physical realm. How do I get it to experience it in this place? Because it's one thing to keep shouting I'm wealthy, but how do I live out of the reality of wealth that is my portion and is who I am? I want to shout I am healed, but how do I live out of the reality of who this person is that is healed, that is me? Amen? So we need to learn how to possess our possessions. Because everything, listen to me, from your house to the vehicle, the transportation that you need, to whatever, your children, every aspect of your life is found where? It's found here. It's found in this place. There is a nothing lacking, nothing missing place for who you are. And it is the ultimate reality. And it is in the superior place. Amen? So, let's go. Let's deal with faith this morning. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 in the New King James first. almost done. It says, now faith is the what? Substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen stated. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hoped for means what? It's speaking of a future. Substance is now. Substance. This says substance. This says substance. So faith is the substance Of things what? Hoped for. Are you seeing this? Where's the substance? In the superior reality, which is where? Yeah. You want this that is in the superior reality to be made manifest? Here. But if you don't possess it here, you will never possess it here. Put that same scripture in the Amplified. It says, now faith is the assurance It's the confirmation, the title deed of the things that we hope for. Being the proof of the things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact that which is not perceived to the sense. Stay there. So faith is the title deed. Are you with me? If I give you my car to drive, but I keep the title deed, whose car is it? But who has it? You. Do I have it in my possession? But who owns it? Me. You see, sometimes you might not have it fullness in in possession in the natural. But if you have ownership of it here, I can go fetch whatever I need to go fetch and tell you, listen here. Frank, give my car back, please. He can argue all he wants, but if I bring the officers of the law onto the scene, who are they going to say must take the car? Me, why? I've got legal right to it. I have the title deed. I own it. If you want your healing, if you want your financial breakthrough, if you want your marriage to last, whatever it is, you can go find the title deed here. And once you have the title deed in your hand, when you come into the atmosphere and the environment of the natural and the enemy says, no, you say, I got by his stripes, I am made whole. I take possession of this title deed. I take ownership of my healing. And then he says, no, but you feel that pain there. He says, I don't possess the pain. I possess the title deed that says, this is my healing. Now I bring all angelic hosts. I bring the God of heaven onto the scene and I say, Lord, according to your word, I have ownership of my healing. Therefore, I reject whatever the enemy is trying to put upon my body and any symptom that is trying to come upon my body. Why? Because I have legal right and ownership to my healing. Oh Lord, oh no, the enemy is saying they're going to take away your stuff uh, that you cannot possess the possessions that this God has ordained for you. Oh no, you're going to remain poor. No, 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 no. By the Lord says, what well, he was made poor so that I was made rich. The blessing of the Lord is upon me. It adds wealth with no toil. So if you're saying that it's this, I speak to you now and I decree and declare that I take possession of my wealth in Jesus' name. I don't care what it looks like in the natural. I don't care what you might think you can hold my possessions. The Bible says the wealth of the sin is laid up for the righteous. So even though they have possession of it, they don't have legal right to it. So when I come on the scene, you've got to let go of my stuff. Why it belongs to me. I have legal right to it in Jesus' name. You see, it's when you come on the scene and I've got the title deed and Flank's got the car and then Flank says, no, you can't have it. It's mine that I walk away. And if I choose not to go after it, whose fault is it? 
It's mine. It's not God's. When the healing doesn't come, whose fault is it? You see, unless you take responsibility, it's not going to change. Because when I walk in faith, it means I take responsibility. Go to Galatians chapter 4. I'm jumping a little bit around, but it's fine. Go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 in the New King James. Galatians 4. Listen. Now I say that the air, you hear me? The air possesses everything. Owner of everything. The air. As long as he is a what? A child. Does not differ from a slave. Even though he is what? Master will stay there. You can have everything assigned to your life. Your refusal to grow up is what's making you look like the rest of the world. So even though you're born again, you're filled with everything, you have dominion wherever you go, you're made in the image and the likeness of God. You, you know what, in, in Galatians, uh, Ephesians chapter, I think it's 1 or 3, where it's, it's verse 18 or something, it, in the Amplified it says, it says that there's a wealth inside of you that is a wealth that no man is able to search out. It speaks of it being unfathomable and incalculable. Imagine that wealth. It says the Gentiles have been given the portion of salvation to a wealth that is incalculable. It's unfathomable. It says that even if you do everything right for the rest of your life. You cannot exhaust all that wealth. But as long as you remain a child, you'll be stuck under the same financial bondage as everybody else because you refuse to mature into the things that God has got for you. Put up that the, 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 the cylinders with the liquid with the spirit soul in body. I want to show you something. The one is 20%. Your spirit man is 100%. Are you with me? 100%. There's nothing missing. The Bible says it's complete. There's nothing you can add to your salvation. You can't affect your salvation because then it means that Christ had to do something else. Christ paid the price for everything. When he was on the cross, he said what? It is finished. There's no more. You can't add. You can't take away. The Bible says you're sealed. So your spirit man is 100%. But what you're experiencing in your body, if you only mature 20%, in your soul, you're going to experience 20% in your life. So if I'm born again, you hear me? Your spirit man, complete, full, everything. Nothing missing, nothing broken. I remain a child. I look like the world. Even though you are master over everything. Think about it. You own everything. Everything, yet you must be treated like a slave. Verse 2 says in Galatians chapter 4, don't go there, it says that you have to be put under tutors. People have to watch over your life consistently because you refuse to grow up. But your refusal to grow up is blocking the manifestation of this in that life. So say, go up to 50 to 50 percent. So now I choose to grow. I go to connect groups. I go to youth. I choose to go to covenant couples. I come to church every Sunday. I know sometimes you have to be online. It's okay. But if you're not in church every week, there's a problem. I'm just saying. Because sitting at home, Watching a YouTube video is not the same as gathering with the saints in the household of God. There's something that takes place in this place physically. I know the anointing can reach through the airwaves. But when you're in a place like this, your expectation changes. There's no distractions around you. Now you're watching the video, then this thing happens, and then you're on your phone, and then you're doing this. No, you're not focused. When you come and sit under the word, it's to do what? It's to give you word that's going to empower you. What? To live the life that God has called you to be. So for me, if you're online, great, whatever. But if you can be in church, you should be in church. Just saying. But if I choose to develop myself 50% of the way, I'm going to experience 50% of that life, of the full life that is actually for me in the natural. 
and go to the last one. This Kingdom Life Embassy. When I choose to study, when I choose to dig deep into the Word of God, when I choose to read, when I choose to attend whenever I can attend. You know what? Can I just say something? I've never missed a service when I'm in Johannesburg since I've started with Apostle. Not once. I've never sat at home when I was here. The only time you won't see me in the service, I'm either working somewhere or I'm away with my family. You won't. Every prayer service on a Saturday at 8 o'clock, I have not missed one unless I've been on a soccer field with my children or unless I've been away. Not one. Since I've started with the apostle, which is 18 years. If you go through my Evernote notes, every time that man opens up his mouth, I make notes. There's not what I've never sat once under this teaching where I've never taken a note unless I've been a protocol or assigned to him as an armor bearer and I've got to watch him all the time. Even then I'm making notes, not the best notes, but I'm making notes. I've got over 400 notes of his teachings alone on my document, on my, on my computer. Why? Because I want to grow up. Hear me. There was once I was praying and, and, and I was dealing with God and, and as I was praying, I was like, you know, Lord, the Lord says, stop looking up, look down. I said, what do you mean? The Holy Spirit says, no, stop looking up, look down. I said, what do you mean? He says, stop looking to me. I've done it all already. It's already done. You need to now exercise that thing that's already done in the earth before you. Stop making this stuff bigger than what it is. It's when you refuse to take responsibility that you will never experience what God has got for you. Every time you come to me, let me tell you something, and I'm not talking about a perfect life. Please hear me. I make a lot of mistakes. Are you with me? I've made mistakes in business, and God has rescued me from those the mistakes. When I've come back and I said, Lord, I did it. This was me. It was my flesh. I repent. I'm changing. I'm moving this direction. Then the power of God shows up. Why? Because the minute I do that, I align my soul with His will, which is in the spirit, and it must start to flow into the natural. So there's nothing that you're facing right now that is because God is stopping you or holding something from you. You see, when He takes you into your world in this period, it's to do what? It's to develop your soul. He grows you in the wilderness so that you can make the manifestation in this place. When Jesus was tempted here, He walked out in the power of, the God, of God. Remember? 40 days in here. What was it? It was to develop him here. Are you with me? I'm going to end. Your soul is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions. Go to Matthew chapter 6 quickly. Sorry, I'm just, I'm going to have to jump now because otherwise we're never going to finish. I've got notes upon notes. I had to ask my children to help me to type out all the scriptures this morning. Because I just kept on adding, 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 even while I'm driving. I'm saying, Judah, take out the computer. Israel, here's my phone. Type the scripture. I need to send the scripture to the people. Israel's like, why you got so many scriptures? I say, I don't know. Just send it. But there's so much that God wants us to know. I feel, you know, I was just saying to Eden, like, I think it was yesterday. I said, Yo, there's so much that I need to learn. Jesus, help me. There's so much that I need to learn. There's so much more to know. There's so much more. Because why? I want to express this life in the earth. And if I look at where I'm living here right now, it's, for me, it's not good enough. Not for what I know that is in here. Think about it. How can you be bound to systems? How can you be bound financially? How can you be bound in your body? How can you be subject to a job? How? If everything is inside of you, how can you be subject here and be bound here? It's because of the refusal to develop here. And the enemy comes to attack you away. Yeah, he can't change this. He has to come here to your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. He has to come and affect you there. So he has to bring you information. You see, you can either have information that comes from the world or revelation that comes from God. And whichever one you adhere to, submit to, is going to determine the outcome of what you're experiencing here. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, it says, The lamp of the body is the eye. So he's saying the light, where you receive light where you are able to see is because of the eye. Are you with me? If therefore the eye is good, your whole body will be full of what? Light. You don't see with your physical eye, you see with your mind, right? 
Are you with me? Your eye is a lens. Your mind has to inter- interpret what the lens sees. So when he's speaking about your eye, he's actually speaking about what you see, which is speaking about your mind. So he's saying, if therefore your eye, your mind, and the way you see is good, your whole body will be full of light. But, move, if your eye is bad, if your mind is bound, your whole body will be full of, if therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how can light be dark? How can light be dark? It's speaking of the knowledge. If the knowledge that you have is dark knowledge, how great is that darkness? So what does he have to do? He has to give you falsified dark knowledge and incorrect information. Because remember we said last week, because the only thing the enemy can do to you is deceive you. He's got no power over you. He's got to deceive you. When he deceives you, body, mind, will, emotions. He needs your will to submit to his. He needs you to say yes to him. You can either say yes, either ignorance or choice. But if he deceives you, ignorantly you're making decisions to align with the kingdom of this world and you're experiencing the curse in your life, but you don't know why. It's because it's dark knowledge. You're submitting yourself to the wrong information and it comes in various forms and fashion. He uses the seven mountains or you'll bring a trauma situation. You'll go through something difficult in your life. He'll come and have people speak words and curses over you. You're not good enough. You're never going to make it. You're the worst. How could you even ever think of being something like that? Why? Well, could you even think you can be a preacher? How can you even think you can be a millionaire? How do you, how dare you even think that you can do this thing for God? How dare you even consider yourself to fulfill the purposes and the plan of God? He'll come to speak to you where in your soul. This is where maturity is locked up. Because this is already fully mature. It's complete. You can only change your level of maturity in your soul. But it's dependent Upon the knowledge you receive, whether revelation or dark knowledge. That's why education, i got no issue with education, but education cannot precede revelation. Revelation first. Then you add education on top of revelation. Because then you're adding knowledge to light and it will remain light. But where you've been educated in a system of darkness then when you must switch over to the kingdom of light, you have an issue. Because why there they tell you you must save. I'm not saying saving is bad, please hear me. But that knowledge comes after revelation. You sow first. Don't be quiet. Because don't judge another man's harvest. Don't judge another man's harvest. Don't look at Apostle and he's, he's in Mauritius with his family. Don't judge his harvest. How many holidays has he sown to other people? How many? How many times has he booked accommodation for other people? He has sown his seed and he's reaping his harvest. Don't judge another man's harvest. Don't look at another man and think, yeah, but Lord, why are you doing it? There's no favorites. The Bible says in the book of Acts, Peter says, if anybody works the system, I'm paraphrasing, you can receive it. You will walk in it if you work the system. So if you're refusing to grow, if you had 20% and somebody's committed their lives and living at 80%, how dare you judge that person? Because you are also master of all. But you're choosing to be a slave. It's time to take responsibility as Christians, as believers, as children of God. It's time to take responsibility for our lives and not just sit there and think, Somehow, some way, God's got to wave a wand and something's going to happen. No, He's done His part of it. If you're looking for God to do anything for you, you're mistaken and you're outside of the understanding of what, of what it is to be saved. Because God has done everything you could ever and needed to do for your life to be the greatest life that you could ever be. It's done already and it's in your spirit and it is a reality. It's your commitment to growth and development that determines the outcome on this side. That's why there's a scripture that says, I'm going to end with these two scriptures. Worship team, you can come up, otherwise you're going to be here till tomorrow. Where's the scripture? Uh, 3 John 1 verse 2. It says, Beloved, I pray that you may what? Prosper. That prosper is not money, it's everything. In all things and be what? In health, just as you're what? So to the degree that you have soul prosperity is the degree that you'll experience prosperity and healing in your body. 
It's locked up where? In your soul. Last one. Proverbs 23 verse 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so easy. Whatever you are experiencing in your life right now, it's a product of what you've determined to deal with in your soul. You choose to not forgive somebody, it locks itself up in here, and you cannot grow beyond that point, even though God has got everything for you here, and it's already done. You will never experience it in its fullness over here. It's a year of elevation. Here God's going to establish you. It's not future in the spirit. It's real in the spirit. You're already elevated. You are already established. You're already set in the place that God has ordained for you. The challenge is where? It's sitting over here. Go to James quickly. I think it's James chapter 1. I gave you the scripture this morning. James. It says, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow with wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to do what? Not save your spirit, save your soul. You see, when you're refusing to engage with developing your life, your mind, studying the word of God, understanding the kingdom principles, when you're refusing to move down that way, you are refusing to experience the life that God has ordained for you. But every time you make a decision, and say, so, you know, I'm going to get up, I'm going to go to service. I'm going to get up, I'm going to go to that couple's thing. I'm going to get up, I'm going to go to and study. I'm going to go and learn, oh, here's another course. I'm going to go on to this course and I'm going to develop myself. Every time you choose to do that, you increase your ability to produce the life that God has already given you. The limitless is here. Your limited is here. Your soul is determining the limitations under which you live by, and it's not of God. The biggest thing that you have to move out of this here is a victim mentality. Because the victim never takes responsibility. I'm not saying that people don't go through stuff. Please hear me. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that things that we deal with and experience in life, they are difficult sometimes. They create trauma. They create experiences that the enemy uses to remind us of our past or whatever it is to keep you bound. What is his whole point is to do? What is to keep you here bound. If he keeps you at 20% here, even though you got all of life here, you're only going to experience 20% here. Are you with me? What I'm saying to you is that when I take responsibility, here, no matter what I've been through, and people have gone through much worse things than me, please hear me. But even those people that have taken the thing and said, you know what, I'm going to take responsibility at this level. I mean, you look at Joyce Meyer, who was sexually abused by her, by her dad for all those years. And she could get up and still do what she's doing today. She took possession way of her soul. She said, I'm not going to let this thing kill me when God has given me everything that I could ever need and want in my life. Even to the point of where she, before he died, she bought her dad a house to go live in. Do you know how free you must be here? To be able to do something like that. Now, don't judge her. When you see it, what has transpired in a life year, but you judging her because you don't know what she did. You don't know what seed she sown. You don't know what things. You know when people start talking about pastors, I put my eyes away. I don't even look at certain stuff. Why? You don't know. When some people, people even have podcasts about other pastors talking about the, the, the amount of wealth and money they have. That just shows me that you're still stuck in the world and its system. I don't know, maybe I don't know what that person did to get there, but I'm telling you that if you sow seed in the kingdom, you must reap a harvest. How? We're supposed to be the wealthiest people in the world. How can we be the poorest? It's not possible. Do you not understand? It's not possible. This is the reality. How can we be poor when this is who we are? It is not possible. <laughs> we should be leading and taking over wherever we go. Why? Because we should be focused on developing our lives in order to grow up and mature so that we don't need somebody to look over us. I'm talking about having masters and tutors. Some people need a job. Why? Because you need a master over you to tell you to get up in the morning and when to go to bed. I say, Aina, near Aimeni. 
Yeah. Why? You need a tutor over you, even though you should be owning that business. Hello. You will never get into it because you refuse to grow up. Are you understanding me? So when I choose to grow up and I choose to develop myself, I'm going to express the life that is really me, which is 100% in the kingdom of God. This is my charge to you today. As we move forward in this year, and the apostle's coming back with some word, I'm telling you now already. It just is who he is. But he's coming back with revelation to drop into this ministry, to take us where God wants us to be. When you understand, when that word comes, after God has given his word, the Bible says his word cannot return to him void, but must accomplish that you be purposeful. God's played his part. It's up to you to participate. Because you cannot partake unless you participate. Unless you take responsibility and say, this is the year that I'm going to grow up. This is the year that I'm going to make a fresh commitment. This is the year that I'm going to do what God has called me to do. And in the simple things of faithfulness, even in the ministry, I'm going to serve where I'm called to serve. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to make my way to prayers every Saturday. I'm going to get, why? What are you doing? It's got nothing. You know, God's not ticking no boxes for you. It's you saying to your soul, this is who I am. It's you saying to yourself, I'm choosing this way because I'm not going to remain a 20% Christian anymore. I'm shifting my life this year. I'm shifting gears this year. I'm going to experience more of the limitless that God has got for me. This is the year that I'm choosing to grow up. This is the year that I'm choosing to stand up and do what God has called me to do. Please stand. Everybody should be serving somewhere. Not for me, for you. I don't want it to get too tight. I'm just saying. Whatever you're faced with in your life right now, there's a 90% chance that it's you. Let's put yourself in that position. And for you to get out of that position, all it takes is a simple alignment with God and it's done please hear me the more you grow and develop this year the more you can experience the, and express the life that God has got for you but it's in your hands amen it's in your hands just lift your hands this morning let's pray together say Father this year is the year I grow up. I'm going to make a fresh commitment. Sorry, I am making a fresh commitment to learn, to grow, to be faithful, to be obedient, and to do what you've called me to do. Help me, Lord. Empower me, Father, in this next season to become who you've called me to be. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can look around the room this morning, but I'm telling you now that when you make a commitment to grow with God, the people that you see around you now are not going to look the same in the next four or five months. That's why don't, don't, don't discard the youngsters. Don't discard the youngsters. Kill that buzz. Don't discard the young people because all they need is light. And the more light you pour into them, the more you'll see them grow and express God in their lives. I'm trusting God for something so supernatural over this church in the next season. That as we make a commitment, a fresh commitment to God, to His kingdom, to grow, to develop, to study, get up and pray. Get up and pray. Get up and read your, the Word of God. Put, put a system in your life that every day I'm reading X. Every day I'm reading so much because at the end of this month, I must be finished reading this. Put it in your life. Factor it into your life. So why? So that you can grow and become all that God has called you to be. In Jesus' name.